My name is Cyrus Sabat. Welcome to my 3D printing wearable workshop. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Max Manasa. Uh, my name is also Metaverse Max. But I was looking at the other talks that were done before me here. This is going to be sort of like a timeline. To get to NASA was a fairly straightforward one, honestly, once things started rolling. Super lucky and fortunate opportunity. It's like lucky and fortunate opportunities kept snowballing. And I was like, yes, okay, keep it rolling, keep it rolling. I'm doing research on distributed deep machine learning, which sounds very fancy. Uh, he who lives by a 3D printer dies by a 3D printer. I have a passion for fashion. You choose to play, and that's what makes it fun.
because all of this is just fuel. This gets us, you know, this gets us where we need to go, but this piece actually is what gets us to the moon. Uh, so this piece is the part that is, um, has to be accurate, has to be timely. Um, and it's also responsible for the safety of the crew, right? Because the Orion crew capsule, which is this piece right here, with the exception of the safety abort system, this whole piece is where the crew sits. So the crew sits directly on top of ICPS. So if ICPS has an anomaly and blows up or something like that, um, certainly the crew would be placed in jeopardy for that. Um, so we have several different configurations of, I, of SLS, and right now we're working on block 1B. And so again, this is just the ICPS sitting inside that adapter, oops, sitting inside that adapter, uh, waiting basically until it gets to orbit before it does its uh, interjection burn. Uh, these are some photos that I was able to take um, that were available for public release. I wanted a closer photo, but they, they're kind of restrictive on what I could release and what I couldn't release. Um, but essentially, just a breakdown here, this whole tank that you see, that whole like upper part, that's all fuel. That's liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen tanks in there. And then these little bottles you see on the outside, these little red bottles are probably hard to see where you're at. Those are hydrazine bottles. We use hydrazine because it's pyrophoric, so all, we don't need any sort of machinery to ignite that. We just open it up to the atmosphere or lack thereof if it's in outer space um, or low Earth orbit, and it'll automatically ignite and use those as thrusters to get where we need to go. So there's no actual machinery there. It's just a matter of fact of opening up the right valves and the right timing. And the hydrazine will automatically ignite and get us where, kind of position us where we need to go, and then you have the RL11 engine which does the final um, thrust to get us to the moon. This is it, and it's compacted stage, so it's got, it's got a nozzle cone that actually extends out much further than that uh, that can uh, gimbal, so it can go up and down and back and forth and actually guide the, the shuttle where it needs to go or, or guide the ICPS where it needs to go. So that's currently what I've been working on, and I'll sh show you this last slide of it. So this is from the Artemis 1 mission. And so this is the only photo I could get, or only video I could get um, of it actually in action. So this is the LVSA being separated from the R11. This will extend called the NEDS deploy. This will extend and then begin to gimbal. And once it's able to do that, it can guide the uh, spacecraft to the moon. Um, <clears throat> I guess there are limited room for cameras up there. Um, so this is just, um, before I get in, so I had worked on ICPS, told you about ICPS, let's talk a little bit about kind of where we see the future of this stuff going. So, you know, the Artemis 1, first human uh, spacecraft to the moon, that's now Artemis 2, obviously this is a little outdated. Uh, first humans to the moon, and so, and then we're gonna have Gateway. Gateway is gonna be similar to the ISS, because as you may or may not know, ISS is planning to be deorbited around 2030 which is really sad to me. You'll see later in this presentation that most of what I do is ISS-related work. Um, so we'll see what happens when ISS gets deorbited. But in its place, they want to put what's called the Lunar Gateway, which will be a habitat system that goes instead of around low Earth orbit, goes around lunar orbit, um, and will provide like a launch platform to go out to places like Mars and things like that. Um, so ultimately, our goal is to get Gateway out there and then we have the Artemis 3 to 5, which would be deep space missions that would be onto Mars. Um, probably not beyond, I'll be honest, but we can say beyond, it sounds cool. Um, but probably definitely to, to at least Mars, which would be the ultimate uh, goal. And so NASA, as a result of, of this program, which costs about f 4 to $5 billion a year, um, which actually is not that much, uh, all things considered, but various technologies have been uh, sort of invented or are in the stages of invention in the hopes of uh, ultimately being able to do this one day. And so one of the things that's been a huge focus is uh, ISRU, or in-source resource utilization. All these different technologies, the ability to mine, the ability to take regolith, whether it be lunar or Martian regolith, and create something useful out of it so that we can actually have a sustainable living habitat there. That's being developed. Obviously, the gateway is being developed. Uh, a way to communicate with the gateway is being developed because right now you have dark spots. You can't have constant lines of communication with anything in orbit. Um, so things like that. So a lot of technologies are being developed in, you know, simultaneously along with 
um, the development of the Artemis rocket or SLS rocket Artemis mission. Um, so I always put the slide in no matter who the audience is because I do think it's important to highlight here, um, especially in today's day and age where um, not everyone sees the government as a you know, source of good. I, I do. Um, so one of the things that NASA helped develop was the miniaturization of the camera and that miniaturization of the camera enabled it to be put into um, phones ultimately. Back in the 1960s when Kennedy was president, they developed the LED, which is obviously a lower power energy source. That came out of the need for something low power. Um, Jaws of Life was another NASA invention, and then obviously the foil blankets that, you know, the survival mylar blankets were a NASA invention, and then we had thousands more. And all of these stemmed from some sort of seed funding that the government provided, right? So I think it's important to acknowledge that. All right, so now getting on to what I do on my day-to-day -day before I went on detail. Again, on my detail, I worked ICPS, I worked on SLS. So this is where I came from and this is where I'll be going to when that detail ends in like another month and a half. Um, and that is the in-space manufacturing portfolio, which details heavily in ISRU and source resource utilization, the ability of just making things out of, you know, what you have available on hand, sort of survivalist in a, nat in a way. Within that program, in space manufacturing, NASA has split it up into three different programs. You have electronics manufacturing, they can do like uh, printable cortisol sensors to look for stress in the astronauts. Also, they do a lot of um, glucose sensors and monitoring and things like that that can actually be manufactured using limited resources in low Earth orbit. All of this stuff is station based, so it's all going to be developed in low Earth orbit, um, which doesn't always translate to lunar or Martian orbits or surfaces because you obviously have some gravity component that you don't have on the ISS. Um, you have multi-materials or metals manufacturing. This is the one that I was the principal investigator for. Um, and then you have recycling and reuse, which is self-explanatory. So I was the PI for both of these. Um, and then Curtis Hill was the PI for the electronics manufacturing. Um, so in, within those programs that I just discussed, so we want to demonstrate all of those with the ISS. Um, once they've been fully vetted and the ISS is able to you know, fully work in a low gravity environment um, and also a constrained environment, resource constrained environment. Then ultimately we want to try to get small scale uh, technology demonstrations on the gateway, should the gateway become reality. Again, gateway doesn't exist yet. And then finally, we would like to use them large scale as a habitat. So that's like the far reaching picture of where we see these technologies going. Um, currently the US produces 292.4 million tons of waste, um, and we recycle 69 million tons. So the amount we generate compared to the amount we recycle um, is pretty much nil. And so one of the technologies that we develop has uses not only for outer space or ISS, but we'd like to bring some of that technology home so we can start recycling some of this 292.4 million tons. Okay, so this is the current logistical paradigm that the ISS has. So we keep all these spares uh, for the ISS. We see, keep 17,000 kilograms of spares for the, IC, uh, for, the um, for ISS. Something, something breaks, something breaks, something fails on orbit. Um, within a matter of a day or two, we can upmass it and get it back to the ISS so that it'll have it on station. At any given time, we have a certain amount of spares that are currently on station, so if something, those are gonna be critical spare items. So if something breaks on ISS, they can replace it immediately. Um, and then we have an expected average annual failure rate of 450 kilograms. And so the logistical model to keep the ISS afloat um, is quite extensive, namely because we spend thousands and thousands of dollars on maintaining all of these spares. And so the program that I'm a part of, Recycling, Reuse, and On-Demand Manufacturing, is really looking at ways to reduce the sparing necessary to keep ISS or in the future gateway sort of flow. Because obviously if you have gateway, which is around the lunar orbit, it's gonna be a lot more expensive to get spares there than, than the ISS. Um, so this was a study that was done at MIT. Um, should be a reference on here, I don't see it. His name is Andrew, he's from MIT, he's, he's a good guy. So I'll, I'll give him a shout out here. Um, so the current model is we have these traditional spares 
And so at least 5,000 kilograms of spares are kept aside at any given moment just in case something breaks. And we don't always use those spares. Sometimes stuff never breaks. And then they just sit there and they're wasted. With in-space manufacturing, the ability to manufacture some of these spares, we expect a decrease of 78.3% of spares. And then if you include ISM with the ability of recycling, we expect a decrease of 97.7% uh, of available spares. So we expect this, uh, if you include in-space manufacturing and recycling, to go down drastically. Um, the current model we use for waste is uh, these things called trash footballs. They're basically Kevlar made trash bags. You stuff all of your trash in them. You load them onto a Cygnus module, which is a European uh, module, and it burns up on reentry. And that's currently how we dispose of all the waste on station. Um, so we basically just incinerate it. And we want, you know, I want, especially since I'm the PI for this project, a better way of doing things. Um, and so one of the things my project did was we looked at 3D printing, the ability, if say we sent up a spare and that spare was made out of ABS or PLA or polycarbonate or any one of those 3D printable materials or Altem, if you need a high strength material, um, if the spares we sent up were made out of those and one breaks, could they grind it, recycle it, and remake that spare? And in some cases, yes, depending on the material. In some cases, no. Sometimes you have material degradation, depending on how many times that material has been recycled. Sometimes you need to cut it with a virgin stock material to increase its material properties. So there are things that go into that. But just as a first test case, we designed this wrench on, uh, on the ground. We emailed it to them. They were able to 3D print it on orbit with a printer that we have up there. Um, uh, this is uh, not that guy, but this guy's Don Padet. I did want to mention that I have this guy's autograph from when I was 18 before I even knew that I'd work at NASA. So I've kind of met him in my past. Um, the other thing we're working on is um, a solution for recycling filament. Because if you recycle 3D printed filament, and you have plenty of 3D printers over there, so I'm sure a lot of you are aware, sometimes the filament comes out kind of janky after you recycle it. Like, it might clog the nozzle, it might be thick, it might have different parts where it gets thin and then thick, it might not have the viscosity you're looking for, it might not have the flowability you're looking for. And so uh, we, with the help of Cornerstone, uh, Cornerstone Research Group based out of Ohio, developed this um, recycler module where the stuff would go in the extruder, the material would go in the extruder, and then in here, as it's extruding, it goes through an inline DMA dynamic mechanical analysis. So it'll look for the mechanical properties of that filament as it's being produced. And if it's not, you know, the correct viscosity, flowability, or things like that, things that it's looking for.
you know, I want, especially since I'm the PI for this project, a better way of doing things. Um, and so one of the things my project did was we looked at 3D printing, the ability, if say we sent up a spare and that spare was made out of ABS or PLA or polycarbonate or any one of those 3D printable materials or Altem, if you need a high strength material, um, if the spares we sent up were made out of those and one breaks, could they grind it, recycle it, and remake that spare? And in some cases, yes, depending on the material. In some cases, no. Sometimes you have material degradation, depending on how many times that material has been recycled. Sometimes you need to cut it with a virgin stock material to increase its material properties. So there are things that go into that. But just as a first test case, we designed this wrench on, uh, on the ground. We emailed it to them. They were able to 3D print it on orbit with a printer that we have up there. Um, uh, this is uh, not that guy, but this guy's Don Padet. I did want to mention that I have this guy's autograph from when I was 18 before I even knew that I'd work at NASA. So I've kind of met him in my past. Um, the other thing we're working on is um, a solution for recycling filament. Because if you recycle 3D printed filament, and you have plenty of 3D printers over there, so I'm sure a lot of you are aware, sometimes the filament comes out kind of janky after you recycle it. Like, it might clog the nozzle, it might be thick, it might have different parts where it gets thin and the thick, it might not have the viscosity you're looking for, it might not have the flowability you're looking for. And so uh, we, with the help of Cornerstone, uh, Cornerstone Research Group based out of Ohio, developed this um, recycler module where the stuff would go in the extruder, the material would go in the extruder, and then in here, as it's extruding, it goes through an inline DMA, dynamic mechanical analysis. So it'll look for the mechanical properties of that filament as it's being produced. And if it's not you know, the correct viscosity, flowability, or things like that, things that it's looking for, 